David, um, by any definition, you've had a very successful career. Um, what were some of the things that you think you did early on? What habits did you set? What priorities did you set in your early college years or, or your early years of your career that you think have been you know, contributing to that success? I didn't get that drunk, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> early college years. Um, I think, um, listen, I think there's a, probably this is probably this, I was talking about I don't have anything written for this commencement speech, so I'm in a lot of trouble already. <laughs> so, um, but I think there's, uh, you know, just through life, I think it's how you bounce back from disappointment and failures. So I think, uh, you know, how you recover and how you move on. So, for instance, when I came here, Bob said I, I you know, I, I took a job at Republic Steel. Mm -hmm. When I came out of here, well, Republic Steel was on its way to bankruptcy, but, um, you know, uh, you know, and I could have gone down to LTV down in Dallas, but I, I chose to go up in Boston for mutual fund. Um, so there's always those challenges of things going on, and I was, when I was at Republic Steel, I was there for maybe three months, and. Um, they gave a 7% across the board pay cut. And everybody in my graduate school decided to call me up and say, hey, great choice, Tepper. You know? <laughs> but it actually was a pretty good choice because they did more financings in the next, you know, next year or two years than they did in the whole 100 year uh, history of the company. So being up in the Treasury Department, that company was on its way to bankruptcy. Eventually, you went bankrupt with LTV. Um, there was a lot of things, things to learn, a lot of opportunities there. And if I go through my career, um, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of disappointments. There's a lot of things that didn't go right. But it's, those aren't the things that make you. It's how you bounce back and where you move on from there and how you, what you learn from those things. And, you know, it's kind of the river flows. You know, the river flows. That should be, some, that should be out of some, somebody's culture, the river flows. But, you know, you, you have to make choices on where your life goes. But you never stop flowing. You never stop riding the river. You never stop dancing. You know, so I just think you kind of keep pushing forward. Because you're going to have disappointments, you're going to have problems in your life, you're going to have different things that go wrong. But that's not what's going to define you. What's going to define you is how you recover from those things and how you move on. So that's, that should be the commencement speech, right? That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got a sneak peek. That was very inspiring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so with that, we'd now like to open it up to the audience. So as you guys can see, there's mic set up on the left and the right. So if you have any questions, you can start lining up now, and we'll start with questions soon. And again, we would like to remind students to say their name, year, and school as well, their program. If there's no well, questions, I can go out in the sun. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, if the audience puts a second to think, we have additional you have, questions. You have so extra ask, questions? Yeah. <laughs> um, so... You know, we talk a lot about the school, but I think this is a great opportunity to learn more insights about your career and your approach to business. So as business students here, what are some lessons that we need to learn in addition to what you just said that are not covered in the textbooks? Um, there's a lot of opportunities for, to learn here on Carnegie Mellon um, and access to a lot of resources. So yeah, listen, I, I was just, I was actually out at, uh, was, what's it, uh, spring, spring fling, spring... Carnival. Carnival. No, what was outside with the hamburgers and hot dogs? Tepper Spirit. Tepper Spirit. Yeah, I didn't get a hot dogs because I was afraid <laughs> of slopping mustard on myself. So, um, but anyways, I was telling somebody out there that uh, one of the things I think you have to do when you're in business is always try to be ethical and honest. Um, I was telling them a story about um, when I was at Goldman Sachs. Um, uh, they had this, they, they set up uh, this fund, this bankruptcy fund. And the person that set up the bankruptcy fund was, uh, was the head of M&A, okay? And this was back after Drexel Burnham, if you know who Drexel Burnham went, went under. And um, so they were in charge, the guy that was head of M&A was in charge of this fund that was buying assets. So he wanted to buy this one company's bonds. And um, he gave an order for it in, and I refused his order because the, the company was on the restricted list, the restricted list, no buy list, because they had inf information inside the firm the day before, and he took it off the next day. So I told him, I'm not buying it. I'm not going to buy it. So it was a big thing. We went to legal, and then legal said to me, you know, it's okay. You know, it's not a problem. You can buy mm -hmm. things from them. And I, I refused to buy anything else for this guy. 
Now, since he was the head of M&A, it really didn't help me in the next time I was up for partner. <laughs> but um, I don't know if you know this, it didn't really hurt me in my career. <laughs> okay, so I think that there's kind of a thing to always running your life right and always doing the right thing and always run it ethical. And don't be afraid if somebody says to do something that you really think is not right, don't do it. So I don't think, they may teach you that, but when you're on the line, I'm just going to say it again, don't do it. So at some point in your life, you're going to have kids, and especially if you have kids, you look at your kids, you say, well, I'd rather see my kids or I'd rather not see my kids. You know, if it comes down to those sort of things, you think things aren't really right. Don't do things that aren't right. Do, like, stay true to yourself always. So I don't know if they teach that or not, but, you know, you kind of know that already, right? Being a good Pittsburgh person. Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Oh, uh, there's somebody in the audience. Hi, my name is Hannah Jessingani. I'm a first year MBA. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my question is around how the program prepared you and made you successful and achieve this phase of your career. Um, is there any advice you can give current students about how we can perhaps someday um, be as successful as you are? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have, uh, I, I like to say, you know, on my desk, there's three little pigs. And I, I toss the pigs and see how they land. And then I make decisions on that basis. <laughs> I'm going to send you those pigs. <laughs> you know, so, no, um, listen, I think this place really did. I really do think that this place at the time gave me uh, uh, the tools that I needed to be um, well prepared and, and in front of other people. So I really do um, you know, always think that I owe this school a debt of gratitude. I might have paid it back, but I owe them a debt of <laughs> gratitude. You know, so I, um, I do think you get a great education here, and I think that that uh, that did pre- prepare me pretty well. Um, um, uh, what was your second part of your question again? Any advice you can offer current students on how we can be as successful as you? <laughs> the hardest part of the question, right? Um, Listen, I, I just think, like, with some of the other advice I, I just offered, I just think, you know, just keep your feet moving. Don't get stuck. Um, try to do what you like, if you can do it possibly. I mean, I happen to like investing. I mean, if you, ha- if you like marketing, if you do, you know, like that, try to do what you like. You can't always start out that way, but even if you don't start out that way, you're still going to get experience. You're still going to get things that you can learn from it. So... Like, I was, I'm, I, like, I'm the type of person if, you know, somebody hit me on the road, like an accident, it's still interesting to me what the process is when the police come and all that. <laughs> you know, it's stupid as hell, but it's still interesting to me. But I think you always have an opportunity to learn from different situations, even the ones that are disappointing. So I would say just always try to learn and move on and try to, try to grow from that. So. So do we have more audience questions? Hi, my name is Rafe. I'm a first year MBA student. I'm a generally very optimistic person. However, we live in a time where it seems that there's pessimism all around us, especially with tariffs and uh, the politics scenario that's going on. You don't like on. Trump, do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I tend to remain optimistic in general. Yeah. What are your views on this? How do you see the next five years Checking out, we're entering the job market again. Uh, so, how would you encourage us to think about these situations and the scenario? Well, you're, you're a first year now. I am. So the economy is really good right now. Okay, yeah. despite you know different things, and you know just to because you kind of alluded to tariffs, I'll talk about some of the policies that have come down, and whether you like, um, and I'm going to try to whether I like the person or not. Don't like the person. I'm not going to get into that. Although I did call him a demented narcissistic scumbag. <laughs> <laughs> and if you, look up, if you look up demented narcissistic scumbag, you'll see my name calling Trump that. If you just, go Google, just Google those three words. But that's besides the point. So we're not going to comment on that now. Um, but from a, from a policy standpoint, I mean, some of the deregulation stuff was probably really good for the economy. We probably, have gone, we probably went too far um, in the Obama years and even Bush put on uh, too many regulations. Now, we might have gone too far deregulating things already, but I think some of those things had to happen, I think, was holding back the economy. And the, and the tax uh, policies 
that they did. Although I don't think they, again, I don't think they were all good, but I think there were some things that needed to be done. I think some of the corporate reform was probably good because we were becoming a high tax country. Um, I don't know if they needed to do the individual stuff. I don't know if they needed to, to do, you know, cut um, some stuff for higher income people one way or another, so I'm not going to say that's good or bad, or, you know, but there was some, those two things I think really were helping to move the economy, really getting the economy going, and, and you really have low unemployment. Now, obviously, the tariffs and attacking individual companies like Amazon, I mean, the attacking individual companies like Amazon is just nuts, okay, it's just nuts, because they own the, because Bezos owns the Washington Post, I mean, you know, but that's, that's what we got. Um, and the tariffs, um, look, I, I think tariffs in general are just, you know, not, not a good thing for the economy. I think putting tariffs on steel and making that a fight in something that's so old economy and something that employs so few people in the country was probably not the best place to start. On the other hand, there is a certain amount, if you talk to tech companies, there is, they believe, and there has been proof, that China has taken in intellectual property. Uh, borrowed it, stolen it, whatever like you like to say. So I think something should have, something needs to be done on that front. Uh, putting 50, the first 50 million in tariffs, whether I, you know, I don't know if I totally agree with it. It's a shot across the bow, and it was was okay. The 100 million was crazy because he didn't tell anybody else in his cabinet. So it's just nuts. It's just nuts. But um, so I don't know where that goes. So I'm not a big fan of it. I think they could have done other things uh, for intellectual properties. As far as your, 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 uh, you know, your prospects, um, listen, the economy seems pretty good as long as they don't take these, these tariff wars too far. And some, I, pro they probably will get a NAFTA agreement. Um, you don't want to take things too far with China because eventually I can tell you the steps that it will go to. And China's retaliation, we've done a lot of time trying to figure this out. And you get to the the fourth step, it's, it's a war. It's a real war. And if you look at the history of, of terrorists, they've resulted in, a lot of times, real wars. So I get a little nervous when you start down that path. And, you know, but I don't think, well, I hope, you know, I, I worry about um, the erratic, erraticness, is that a word, erraticness, of the president sometimes. <laughs> But you hope that, uh, that, that you don't go down that path. If you go down that path, you're kind of, uh, there's a word, it begins with an F and ends with a K. You're kind of that. <laughs> okay. But if there's none of that, I think you'll get a good job. I think the economy will probably stay okay. I'm a little worried about higher interest rates right now. Um, but it, you know, it's, I, I think that uh, it'll probably hold up for when you get out, so, which is kind of important. I think it is a pretty good economy right now around the world, especially the United States. So I think that answered, right? Wow, this feels like, you know, you ever see there's this show, this um, Joy. Anybody see the movie Joy? Yeah. Where at first she gets no calls and then she gets a lot of calls coming in? <laughs> like this, I got a lot of people lining up now. I feel like Joy from that movie. Let's go Hi, with the I'm Katie Glass, first year MBA. Um, one of the benefits we have being part of the Tepper Network is all of the people that we've met or will meet along our career that serve as mentors and advisors. Can you talk about a mentor that you had early in your career and, and the impact that they had on you? Um, oh, I'm trying to think if I had any mentors early. I mean, when I was a, I guess when I was out of under, undergrad, out of Pitt, I, I had a little bit of a mentor at my first job at Equibank, which I, I don't know which bank it's part of now. Um, he, I just always remember one thing he said, he, he said about projections. You want to know what he said about projections? He said, projections are like assholes, everybody has one. So that stuck with me. So, I'm just, this truth, I've always remembered that. That was actually a true story. So, um, but I think mentors, I had, um, I want to tell you about mentors, okay? Mentors are a little bit tricky. So I had a mentor, actually I had a mentor at Goldman Sachs, a little bit of a mentor at Goldman Sachs, his name was uh, Bob Rubin, um, who became co-chair of the firm, eventually became Secretary of the Treasury of the United States at some point. Um, now Bob, Bob was kind of a mentor, but there's, you know, the, the, the third time when I didn't become a partner, it was kind of Bob Rubin's fault, 
and I'll tell you why. So you've got to be careful about this mentor game, right? So he's kind of a mentor, and he liked, he liked being on the floor, and he liked talking to me. Now, I'm, um, at some point, Bob was, had the role of head of fixed income before he became you know, chairman and vice chairman and chairman. And on the way to doing that, he, before that, he was the head of fixed income. And so I would talk to Bob. I was a head trader, and I would go talk to Bob. Eventually, a guy by the name of John Corzine, who became the governor of the state of New Jersey, um, became the head of fixed income. Now, when John Corzine became the head of fixed income, he came from the government side. Bob Rubin came from risk arbitrage. So I was in junk bonds. So um, um, Bob Rubin knew about junk bonds because they have an equity component, so I would talk to him still. I would still go to his office, and I wouldn't go to Corzine's office. Now, Bob Rubin should have said, go to Corzine's office. Okay, because when that third time came up to be partner, Corzine killed me. So what I heard in that partnership thing, right? So even if you have a mentor that becomes secretary of the treasurer, it still is a problem. You got to still think for yourself. You got to know the, the playing field. But um, you know, so that you know that was my fault in a way for not knowing the playing field. But Bob was a was a questionable mentor, right? At that point, now it's lucky for me. Maybe he was a very good mentor because if it was a Goldman Sachs, I would have been not nearly as successful. So maybe Bob was a very good mentor. <laughs> but at the time. When I didn't get that, that partnership the third time, and, and I did everything, I mean, I had, I put a lot of things together, I just, you know, he, you know, he, he was basically, that was the reason I didn't get it, he didn't like me, for that reason. He thought I wasn't one of his people. So, I don't know if that, that helps or doesn't help, so. No, that was a great answer, thank you. A lot you. of stories there, right? <laughs> but we, we haven't had an undergrad, so why don't you have one on your side? Hi, my name is Rachel Frame. I'm a second year undergrad in the Tepper School of Business. Uh, speaking about interest rates, I had a question. In light of uh, the Fed raising rates and with equity prices at an all-time high, where do you foresee the bond and stock markets in the remainder of the year? Where, when? And for the remainder of 2018. Um, listen, it's, it's, it's tough right now because uh, historically uh, yields are fairly low. Um, so, it, it, but it's, it's, it's kind of complicated because I'm actually tonight I'm trying to figure out what the BOJ is doing. Because the BOJ, either this meeting or next meeting, may change their interest rate policy, which will affect our treasuries too, and will affect the stock, affect the stock market. So, I, I think, as far as the stock market is concerned, I think they're okay. I don't think it's great. I think we might have reached the highs for the year, um, and it really has to do with interest rates. I'm not sure. We're right on the cusp of breaking out on interest rates at, at this level, th around three percent. I think they closed at two point nine eight percent on the ten year. Actually, no, because I just looked. But, um, um, but if they do, if they do people, a lot of people don't think they're going to break higher. Most people are saying they'll only go to three and a quarter. And I think if they only go to three and a quarter through the rest of the year, the mark, stock market will be up. But too many people are saying that. You know what I'm saying? So when so many people say that, I become wary that it's not going to hold. So, and if they don't hold, then stocks may have a problem. So that's... Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Let's start rotating between the queues now. So we'll go from the right and then we'll switch back and forth. Hi, um, my name is Eve. I'm a first year MBA at the Tepper School. Um, we learn in business school that there's a lot of focus on prioritization, prioritizing our professional choices and our classes, student groups. Can you talk a little bit about how your priorities have changed over the course of your professional career? Sure. Um, well, I think, I, I mean, I can go back when I first got out of, I'm pointing to you because you went to Pitt too, but when I first got out of college, I mean, you know, there's a, you, your priorities, you know, are intertwined with different parts of your life, really. So when I first got out of college, I probably was very happy to go out three or four nights a week and go out with buddies and you know, then try to come into work the next day and not be too stone, too drunk to work. So, um, eventually that got too old and I got kind of tired of doing that. So then I wanted to go, you know, then I settled down and, and decided I better get married or find somebody to get married to because I didn't want to do that anymore. Um, and I think that, you know, you, your priorities, your priorities go and then you have kids and then you, you know, for me, it was trying to figure out that balance. Because I wanted to do this, I wanted to do the other things in life. I wanted to coach little league 
which I did. I coached uh, baseball and softball and soccer. Um, so that was important to me. So at that point in time, in, and that was a priority to me, to, where I put a lot of my energies was, you know, the balance between work and, and, and my kids. And, you know, you want to be as successful as you can in, in all aspects of your life, not just in your, in your business part, but your personal part if you can do it. Um, I think eventually as my, you know, as my kids got older, I probably switched some of that energy that I was putting on them into, into more charitable sort of things. I always was charitable, but, it, you know, just more involvement in charity and, and more of that sort of stuff. You know, the, the other thing that I think you have to do that I probably, <laughs> I was going to say, I'm going to make a joke about myself, that I probably neglected sometimes. You have to also think about your personal health and your, which I do, I don't neglect that necessarily, but, you know, doing enough physical activity, going to the gym enough times, that's what I was going to make the joke about myself. At. <laughs> um, you know, you know and, and those sort of things too. So that's, I think that's more of a priority now, you know, that whole balance away. And also, for me, trying to see my kids, you know, it becomes as you don't, as your kids aren't in your house anymore, you know, you like to try to figure out how you can see them. And then the, the point where your kids have their kids, it becomes a different party. So I think you have different phases of your life. It's almost like you have different lives, right? You had a life when you were with your parents, you have a life now. And you're going to have a few more lives before you're done. And I think you try to, every one of those lives, I think when you're younger, you, you listen, especially for guys, guys are idiots. If you, <laughs> I mean, every, every, every woman would agree that every guy under 25 is an absolute idiot, so... And I was an absolute idiot, too, so... Um, some guys are still... I'm not going to mention you brother now. <laughs> a buddy of mine's here, so... Um, and, anyways, but I do think there's different priorities at different points in their life, and I think there's... When you're... I think if you can figure it out, that balance, which you guys all struggle with when you're in school, because it's so... the demands are overwhelming. Um, but I think that, that striving for balance should be something, no matter what your part of your life you're in, I think that's something you should try to prioritize and try to figure out. So That was pretty good, right? Yes. Thank you. We'll move over to the other side. Uh, hi, my name is Monsi Kumar. I'm a second year undergrad in the Tepper School of Business. Uh, and my question had to do with your interest in finance and your career in finance. Was it something you always knew you wanted to venture into, or was it more serendipitous? Uh, if so, what did that journey kind of look like, and what advice can you give to students who may not be sure what they want to specialize in within business? That's a great word. <laughs> I would not be serendipitous. Is that how you say that word? <laughs> Serendipity? There's a movie of serendipity that I liked. I think it was with uh, Matthew Broderick mm -hmm. or something. No, yeah, no. Kuzak. Kuzak. Yeah. I get him confused yeah. with Broderick sometimes, right? Anyways, um, no, it wasn't, it wasn't just a coincidence or, or, or such. It was, uh, I think I really, one way or another, I got, a, I, I got uh, exposed to investment. I, my dad um, let me invest in a, in a stock called Career Academies. Um, I was really interested in how the stocks move. It's like I really like collecting baseball cards and you know, statistics and stuff. And then somehow I got the stocks and it's all kinds of numbers. And I love these numbers, the way they played around. So, um, so I invested in this career academy. The company went bankrupt in three months, lost all my money. <laughs> uh, um, that's probably why I'm good at bankruptcies at some point. So. So, but I always had an interest in it. And I had different schemes when I was in college. I had this great, great trading scheme that, schemes, idea that kind of worked for a while and then didn't work. Um, so I always liked markets, and I was fascinated with them. And, um, so it was just natural to go into, you know, that sort of stuff just fascinated me. So I kind of liked it. So it wasn't, it wasn't by luck. And then um, I, I, you know, when I, I, I didn't go there initially. I went to Republic still, but, you know, that, you know, I soon moved to the mutual fund side. So that was kind of, before that, though, I was at Equibank. I was, I started as a credit analyst, and I moved into trust department investing. So I always was trying to get back into investing somehow, so. You know, so some, for me, it was something I always tried to do. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so David, to follow up on your answer there, if you were a student to, in college... How do, how do you get a chance? I thought it would be... <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, but um, just so following up on your answer there, if you were a student right now that's interested in finance, uh, whether it's an undergrad or MBA student, what are the three things you'd be focusing on? That's kind of interesting. Um, we... we, we I, listen, I think you still have to take the, the certain courses that you need here to understand under, under, un, the underlying parts of it. And um, 
I think that's one thing. Uh, you know, I think some people are going to say, you know, you have to be careful because everything's going to be models and machines, machines um, to compete against machines, uh, which there's a lot of machine finance. But the machines are doing shitty this year. Really bad. <laughs> Not good. I'm kicking their ass. So. <laughs> um, the reason, you know, the reason I know this a lot, when I went to Goldman Sachs, I had a model on the desk, a trading model, and it was just, it was just wrong. That's one of the great things about being here. I just knew the option part of it was wrong, the way they had their call prices in there, and that was a good thing to be here, because I, I, I recognized that. I had that, that knowledge from training here. Um, but now, when you see, when people talk about machines taking over, you're, the machines are only as good as people programming the machines. And when you have some times that are changing, like there might be changing higher interest rates, you're out of this long QE environment, quantitative easing environment that we've been in, or this financial crisis environment, and people are continuously programming the same damn thing. And yeah, they'll be less emotional than people, but when the times change, they don't change unless somebody who programs them changes their programs. And when times are changing fast, that doesn't, you know, doesn't work. And when you have a guy like Trump, you better, you better know how to deal with people and know how you know, different emotions work. You know, so, you know, you... It makes, it makes for different, um, different environments. So, um, but I think what you have to understand, even if you do go into, and I don't, I, I don't necessarily think that it's not, those quantitative or those black box deals aren't, can't be really good, but you have to know the fundamental stuff that you learn here, how options work, how finance works, how accounting works, whether you're gonna program those machines or you're gonna compete against those machines. Um, you have to know that stuff. So I think, I, I, I know, I don't have to think, I know this place does a very good job of kicking your ass and making you learn that stuff. So it's, it's you know, so that, for that reason, I think you get the stuff here that you need for that. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's jump back into the audience on the right. Hi, Mr. Tepper. My name is Talon. I'm actually not a business student. I'm an undergraduate senior studying computer science. I'm, in, in what? Uh, I'm, I'm a senior undergraduate studying computer science. Okay, good. But that's okay. Um, well, now that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, just, <laughs> no, well, that's what we're trying to do is get everybody mixed together. Right. So that's Every, everybody right else there. who asked the question seemed to be an MBA student. So, um, no, 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 it's good. I'm glad okay. to have you here. Anyway, my question is: so, a couple of years ago, a lot of companies seem to claim themselves as Uber for X, Y, and Z. And these years, a lot of companies I realized claim to build something. They, they claim to build blockchain for X, Y, and Z. And I, I heard that uh, Goldman Sachs just started to hire for cryptocurrency trader. Uh, some say it's a, literally our future, others say it's just a hype bubble. So I thought, um, I want to ask you, what are your thoughts on this cryptocurrency and blockchain technology? Listen, I, I, I'm no expert in blockchain technology. I'm not bad at markets, but I'm no expert in blockchain technology. I'd understand it, but I'm not, I'm not great at it. Um, as far as cryptocurrencies are concerned, um, Listen, I, 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 I view them more like gold with the trading of them. It's more like a gold type you know, value. I don't see the value above what it costs to mine them, at least the way I, I view them. And, and I think the, the, um, the value, the, the, I mean, there's another value of them that should, the value that should work with them to a certain extent is who can do the fastest, who can make the fastest transaction times, or who can, what, what, which currency can do that? Is Ethereum better than Bitcoin or whatever the new thing is that I don't know about is better than something else? That should matter, but it doesn't matter as much and there's some different speculation. And sometimes what drives that is, you know, the potential of capital controls in one part of their world or another, whether it's, you know, China or someplace else, can drive the value of or, or Bitcoin or, or not around the world. And you see these different markets with different values in, in Bitcoin. So I'm not, I, th I think that um, it's harder, you know, I think if you can, it's hard to analyze the price, price movements of Bitcoins to me, you know, why it's going up or why it's not going up. I mean, it's obviously a demand and supply reasons. And there's some reasons for some of the things I just talked about. So there is some analysis to why that stuff may go up or down, but I'm not a big believer in the fundamental value of the individual currencies above that mining value. Um, but that doesn't mean they can't trade. As far as like, a, a, you know, being on a, 
a trading desk at Goldman or something like that. If, you're a, if you can be on a trading desk and you can be a good trader because you're looking at the information that moves that market and you can figure out how, in this case, and maybe some of the other things we were talking about, at least some, what I think is the other things that have, might move it, um, whether, also whether some, you know, something goes bankrupt or somebody's going to steal your money or whatever it is you know, that can move. If you think you know, there's so, there are some reasons why the thing does move around. So if you can be somebody that can sense those things or get that information, it's kind of basis of basics of trading. So if you can get in a good place, like, you know, Goldman Sachs is a great place to work for five or six or seven or eight years, you know, in my opinion. I, I once said I'd rather work at McDonald's than Goldman Sachs after that, but that's, <laughs> that's another story. I can tell that story why. But, I, you know, so I think you get, you, if you can get in there, you can get in that desk. If that's your opportunity, it's not a bad place to be. But it's, I don't really love... Uh, bitcoins or Bitcoin trading or, or that sort of thing. To me, and I, and I don't really love gold either, by the way. I mean, I would have a little bit of maybe in my portfolio. Of, I actually do own a little bit of Bitcoins because my, my son made a lot of money at some point trading Bitcoins, but um, I think I made $200. So <laughs> um, I actually bought Bitcoins at the absolute low of Bitcoins. I bought it, well, not the, I think I bought Bitcoins at 200 or something. That had to be 200 handle. That had been at the low of the, the recent prices, right? And uh, you know, I sold a little bit and took a little bit of money out, but I, I only put in like $50 or $20 or something like that, so I mm -hmm. can't remember. But anyways, I think that's, that's kind of what I view them as, so. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for being here, Mr. Tupper. We really appreciate it. My name's Anna, and I'm a second year MBA. And I had a question from the entrepreneurial-minded among us. What, uh, what were the early days like when you branched out on your own? And do you have any wisdom to share? Obviously, things have turned out well, but from the early days, were there challenges or um, lessons learned that you could share with us? Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm just trying to think the lessons learned or, or, or whatever. Um, I think some of the things I talked about, you're going to make mistakes and you just keep you know, driving through them. If you have a good idea, you, you know what you're doing, I and mean, you have a basic knowledge of what you're doing. I just think, um, you know, it's, um, it's something to persevere, I guess, would be probably the biggest thing when you're an entrepreneur of something or starting a new business. Because, you, you know, we actually started out fairly fast, but I don't think everybody starts that way. So, depending on what your business is. Um, but we had different growing pains um, of... Uh, <laughs> We, you know, like, we hired the wrong uh, administrative assistant. I made her cry, I think, because so, I was just asking her to do some word thing and she didn't know how, how to do word or something like that. So. But, I mean, you know, it's, it's employee questions and that sort of thing. I think I, I probably would have been a little bit more careful in how we hired some people off the get-go. Eventually, you get a lot better at it, at it. But that's probably not an uncommon thing. You know, and, and I will tell you this. I mean, for, to me, um, you know... One of the, just in general, um, one of the greatest undervalued assets in different places are those sort of people, like administrative assistants and those people that can really help you smooth down the, smooth things in the business. People think they're a little bit less needed now because of the way the world is, but I think they still do a, a very important function. But I just think just hiring people in general is something that you can't be careful enough about when you start out, so. Thank you. Sure. So we only have time remaining for one more question, unfortunately. So we'll take the last question now. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, so Dario, my first year MBA. And as we look and see large segments of change, both geopolitically, technologically, economically, what skills do you think will be important five to 10 years out that maybe aren't important now or haven't been as important in the past as we all look to uh, face our careers in business? Wait, just, can you just repeat it one more time? Uh, just... What do you see as skills that will be important in the future that maybe haven't been as important in the past? First, I want to just comment on your beautiful haircut. <laughs> just just want to say to get that out of the way. You. So, um, you know, it's hard, it's hard to know, you know, what things will be in in, you know, 10 years out. I mean, it really is difficult what will be, what will be um, change, what won't change. I mean, because things drastically change and it's really hard to know some of those things. But I 
think the, if you're looking for an answer of what you're going to do in the future, I think you get a basically great grounding education and you'll be able to navigate whatever change there is. Um, because you don't know what it's going to change. In fact, just when we, one of the things when we built this quad, we built this building, one of the things I insisted on, I don't, didn't, well, I guess I insisted on a few things, but um, is that this building is flexible because just what you're asking. I don't know where we'll be in five years or where we'll be in 10 years. So that building had to be flexible for different changes in how things get taught or what needs to be taught. Because it's one thing, I, the only thing I do know is things will change. And there will be changes and you have changes in your business and you have changes in things that you will do. So I just think you get, you know, you get this great foundation that you can get here. And I think it will, it will um, help you no matter where, it, where things go. But as far as, as far as where they'll go in five or 10 years, I mean, look, I mean, you can see some of the same trends that I see now. I mean, the question is what happens socially for some of those changes? You could think there's gonna be changes that, that there's gonna be, you know, uh, there's not gonna be a need for truck drivers. Well, there may be a revolution in this country before there's a, not a need for truck drivers. You know, you know, understand what I'm saying? So there's, it's hard to know what actions happen, what, what different things may happen. And, um, you, know, what, you know, what I do generally is try to figure out what can happen in different situations. But if you're just prepared with, um, you know, with good things, continually try to learn things from wherever you go, I think you'll be ready for whatever changes come. All right, thank you. Let's sure. go, Pens. <laughs> awesome. So with that, um, I'd like to conclude this afternoon's event. I want to start off by um, just saying thank you to everyone that joined us today. Um, the time did flow by, and students do have their evening classes, unfortunately, so we do have to conclude now. Um, David, thank you so much for joining us. You are. Um, it's been truly a highlight. <laughs> so was it better than the sun? Was it better than being outside in the sun or not? That's the question, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> I think I speak on all, behalf of all the students here when I say that we hope that you come back to this campus often. Sure, thank you. Um, and on the behalf of the Temper community, I'd like to present to you a special present that was made just for you. Um, this is a Temper Quad uh, photo collage made for you. We hope this reminds you of the vision that all, everyone here, as well as oh, generations of Temper students and cool. alumni share for this oh, school. great. And here you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. These are current students now? Yes. Are, that's the first year full-time class. First year MBAs? Yes. Where are you? In the back. In the back. <laughs> I can't see in this class. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Oh.